Uh, I would like to thank all of the speakers uh, for your interesting presentations. We have still half an hour left for the discussion. And I also already received some questions. Uh, a very simple one for Dr. Petra Krajnovak is, are the results of the study that you presented today available online? If so, you can maybe share it in chat with everyone. <laughs> um, um, we've submitted several papers and they are under review. So the project is one year on the go and we, we are just generating these results and attempting to publish. But I hope that they will be like by the end of the summer and by Googling my name, you will be able to find most of these results. Okay, good luck then. I hope yeah, they get published soon. Thank you very much for presenting them today. It was indeed very interesting. Um, also, um, uh, Urška Valintic has some questions for Vitoria, so maybe uh, she can ask those questions herself. So, so go ahead, please. Yes, I wanted to ask um, how many content moderators are there for Slovenian language, if you can share that information with us. Thank you for the question, and, and this is a very common question that we're asked. Um, you know, people often ask us about the number of people working on content from a specific country or the number of local language content reviewers that we have. Um, but we, we unfortunately don't give out these numbers. And the reason why we don't give these numbers out is because um, it's not accurate to only give the number of content reviewers. That alone does not reflect the number of people working on a content review for a specific country at any given time. So there's lots of uh, content that is reported in Slovenia uh, that does not necessarily require local language expertise. So things like nudity, which goes to what we call a language agnostic team for review. And this number also wouldn't include the teams that we have centrally that are experts in, in complex topics like terrorism or hate speech or child safety or the teams of engineers and product managers that we have building the, the kind of proactive detection technologies that are in place to remove content in, in Slovenia. Uh, but globally, we have 35,000 people, as I said, working to provide safety on the platform, including 15,000 content reviewers who are you know, collectively capable of reviewing content 24 seven in, in more than 50 languages, including Slovenian. Uh, maybe one um, another question would be, um, we noted from uh, the transparency reports uh, that you publish uh, that 97%, uh, I think, of all hate speech uh, gets uh, removed with the artificial intelligence. Uh, so do you have that uh, number for Slovenian uh, content? Uh, so how much of the content is removed uh, artificially? Uh, unfortunately, no, we're publishing these numbers at a global level. We are not yet publishing numbers for uh, local markets, but we hope to get to that stage eventually. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. The next question is coming from one of our colleagues at the Institute of Criminology. I will let him ask the question himself. Uh, so Dr. Alej Zavashnik, uh, please go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, yeah. Thank you very much for these interesting presentations. I was really thrilled you made my day, I would say. Um, uh, I have a question for Ms. Federici. Um, uh, thank you for kind of a bird eye view of the policies you have. It is very helpful, I think. Um, my question is, I'm, I'm researching automation in various domains. And um, what's the relation between kind of this uh, automated uh, detection of inappropriate content and human reviewers? Do you have any data of success stories? For instance, we were all reading, I checked five years ago already, it's five years, when Facebook uh, removed the iconic image of a girl fleeing an, an a palm attack, right? In, in Aston Post newspaper. So this was the news how algorithms can get it wrong. But what's your impression and uh, do you have any data of the success of automation in moderating content? Um, okay, so let me speak about hate speech specifically. I mean, traditionally, we have used our proactive detection technology to identify potentially violating content and then to send it to our content review team. Um, but since 2019, we've actually improved our technology such that we can now start to remove hate speech as well. 
Um, one method involves detecting and automatically removing content that matches existing hate speech violations in, in our database. So this is text or image matching. Another method involves proactive detecting potentially violating content and then giving it a score according to its similarity to content that we have previously removed for violating our hate speech policy. Uh, beginning in 2019, in the second half of 2019, our systems actually began removing posts automatically when they received very, very high scores or matched existing hate speech in our database. And, and but, the, but I just want to stress that this is in very select instances, you know, where we've trained the automation with thousands, if not millions of content examples. In all other cases, when our systems detect potential hate speech, they actually send the, po the post to our review teams to determine if it should be removed or not. Um, you know, but there's no doubt that we have made huge improvements in, in proactive detection of, of hate speech. You know, one example of, of great progress is in the way that our systems are now detecting violating content in, in the comments of posts. I mean, this historically has been very, very challenging for AI because, you know, determining if a comment violates our policies often depends on the context of the post it is replying to. Another huge area of progress has been in the way our systems now operate in, in many more languages. Um, but I want to stress that, that there's, you know, so much to be done still. Uh, despite these many encouraging improvements. I mean, one big area of focus is getting artificial intelligence to be even better at viewing content in context across languages, cultures, and geographies. Um, you know, that the same words can often be interpreted as either benign or hateful, depending on when they're published and, and who is reading them. And, and training machines to capture this nuance is really, really challenging. Um, in terms of data, I mean, all the data that we have available is, is published in our transparency report. And we, as I said, we, we published one yesterday for the first quarter of 2021. So I encourage, I encourage you to take a look at that. It, it's pretty detailed. Okay, thank you. If I may, oh, just one question, kind of, there's a huge discussion on social media councils so what's your view on the role for instance i think facebook have an oversight board right famous for the trump uh, decision yes. of trump. yeah account. could you kind of shed light on 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 the view of what's the future of the social media councils so i i mean it's hard to speak about the future i can speak about the oversight board today which by the way has just recently been been formed um, so we, we've said for some time that, you know, we don't think that Facebook should be making all of these decisions about content by ourselves. And, and that's why we created the Oversight Board. So for those who don't know, the Oversight Board is a global body of experts and civic leaders from all around the world that exercises independent judgment. And it's made up of humanitarian activists, law professors, uh, former newspaper editors, we have a former prime minister, a Nobel laureate, it's, it's a really diverse group of people. Um, so the way it works is this, if your content is removed from Facebook or Instagram and you have sort of exhausted your appeals with Facebook or Instagram, then you'll be able to appeal your case to this body, which is completely separate from Facebook. And they will have the power to overrule the decision that we made and to recommend changes or additions to our policies as well. Um, and so the board has already started to hear and take decisions on cases. Um, it selected its first case back in December 2020 and published its first decisions almost two months ago. Um, and the board's first rulings were, were a significant moment, I think, for content regulation and accountability, marking the first time you know, an independent body uh, was reviewing a, a private social media company's content decisions at that company's request. Um, I think that, you know, in the absence of, of frameworks made by democratically accountable lawmakers, that the, the board ensures that 
these decisions are made in as transparent and judicious a manner as possible. Um, but I, I wouldn't say that the oversight board alone is, is you know, a replacement for, for regulation. And so that is why we, you know, we continue to call for thoughtful regulation in the space of, of content moderation. Mian Stanko also has a question for Vittoria Federici. Uh, so go ahead. Yes, thank you. Maybe just a short question, uh, a practical question, I would say, uh, for Mrs. Uh, for Mrs. Federici. Um, so my question would would be, what happens when you identify hate speech? And by this, I mean uh, the only the lead such hate such hate speech, or is there also some cooperation with local police, with local authorities, and uh, so on? So maybe just from the practical perspective. Well, it's as I explained before, the hate speech is usually uh, detected by our technology and then it's referred to content uh, reviewers who review that hate speech and then make the final decision based on our hate speech policy. Uh, we don't typically consult with uh, local police. Okay, well, thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, there was also a question from the audience that I will pose. Um, and it is a question of, about something that we haven't touched upon yet. It is um, a question of limits. So where is the limit between freedom of expression? Where is the limit between appropriate and inappropriate speech? Uh, he is asking specifically about um, inappropriate speech regarding the LGBTQ community. So he's asking where is the limit, what still counts as acceptable and when is this line crossed? So maybe if you can, uh, whoever feels the most uh, passionate can answer first. I don't know, maybe Jan, since you're a lawyer, you could like share with us how these limits are drawn. Yes, thank you. So um, it's a hard question uh, without <laughs> doubt. Um, so I can I can speak from the perspective of uh, of a criminal law. Um, this is quite clear. So you have a criminal code, um, and uh, the criminal code gives you some guidelines on um, on let's say what is uh, hate speech which is criminalized and what hate speech is not criminalized. Of course, uh, of course, there are some open questions. Um, however. Um, from my perspective, I, I would also be uh, more interested in, in how you define um, not hate speech, but inappropriate speech uh, in experiments uh, that were uh, mentioned, uh, for example, uh, by Dr. Petra Kral, um, no, Rock and Ida Schultz. Uh, this, this is also something that, something that interests me. So. Uh, Maybe I would I would pass pass on the microphone. Let's say Ida, since you were the one uh, really formulating the guidelines, can you answer this question? Yeah, I can try. Um, the problem is that we had several projects and the guidelines were different. Um, the goal was different, so we were following that because we were in Frank project, because we were fo following goal of um, automatic um, machine learning, those were quite, uh, for me, complicated uh, guidelines. Um, not so, it, it was a combination of uh, social sciences and uh, technical sciences. So I would probably need help here, um, but, First, we start with the intention of the writer. So was the intention to insult someone? Because there's usually no doubt when someone is um, being violent or trying to um, approve violent content. But uh, there's a doubt when there's a uh, insult category uh, in question. So uh, first thing was, uh, what was the intent of someone who's writing that? Um, and, of course, what would be uh, the consequences of someone who is reading that and is part of that community. So if we're talking about LGBTQ um, community, uh, would a person be offended? And especially, I was uh, trying to uh, give that uh, um, from social sciences point of view um, importance, um, is there a generalization 
of something insulting. So um, is there something insulting that is um, talking about all the members of a community or marginalized group? Um, so with us, with us, mostly those were the um, guidelines we were following in those projects, of course. I'm not sure about the technical point of view, what were the li limitations? Maybe Petra, if you can help with this. Well, in the meanwhile, I found the guidelines and I, I pasted it in the chat, but I think that only Christina sees them. If I, there's no chat for everybody. Um, I you, should be, you should be able to chat everybody. Click on my name. Uh, no, there's no option. Oh, really? Oh, then okay, maybe there's a problem in the settings. <laughs> yeah, um, I think I can chat everyone. So if you send it to me, I, I will. So uh, I, uh, yeah, I'm... I can chat, chat with everyone. So uh, yeah, I'm sorry about that. I, I did not realize, but please send it to me. I will share. Uh, so I, I did. Um, so for the offensive, uh, so we have appropriate speech that has no target and is appropriate by, by like, no further defined. Uh, inappropriate contains terms that are obscene, vulgar, but the text is not directed at any person specifically, has no target. Um, we have offensive, including offensive generalization, contempt, dehumanization, indirect offensive remarks. It doesn't have to be one of the protected groups. So it can be also against politicians, against journalists, against your neighbor, whoever. And we have the category violent, which is um, the, where the author threatens, indulges, desires or calls for physical violence against the target. It also includes calling for denying or glorifying war crimes and crimes against humanity. Uh, this is a kind of similar to what is the illegal hate speech or we tried to be in that category. But again, we don't limit to any target groups. So if you go violent against politicians, people in general, the person who's living next door, it is all violent. So we don't uh, distinguish between who is the target or actually we have annotated also the target, but we haven't analyzed it yet and uh, acted upon it. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Jersic Mark has a follow-up, I think. So uh, go ahead, he says he'll speak himself. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so I do have a question. I guess more uh, regarding the conceptual background or almost the philosophical ideas behind uh, hate speech prevention uh, and criminal law intervention and so on. So I, I do realize that in some cases we have symptoms like um, speech that can be considered harmful and then it's almost an instinct to deal with that. Um, for example, via removing social media posts that can be in some cases or perhaps justifiably so, perhaps not um, considered harmful. but I do have an issue with the fact that the jury is still out in regard to more the philosophical issue, free speech per se, because we, I, I think that we do not yet fully comprehend the importance of free speech for our functioning or where the line exactly is like it was at before. So, so my question, I guess, is, uh, is that we, should we not hold our horses, um, as they say, before we start the more operative phase of free speech uh, speech regulations, such as criminal law response and um, uh, moderating content and so on? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, would anyone like to tackle this question? Maybe I can start. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, yes. Since it was it was in part um, also, uh, I mean, in, in part, it also touches upon criminal law. Um, and my answer would be, of course, you know, this is this is what a criminal uh, lawyer or uh, let's say somebody who uh, who um, is researching criminal law should do, you know. Um, and this is why I was talking also about the ultima ratio principle, you know, um, and why I was also emphasizing that um, that we should uh, use or employ criminal law. Um, only in, in cases where, let's say, no other remedy is effective. And um, I think uh, from the criminal law perspective, at least on an abstract level, this is quite clear. 
But of course, when it comes to implementing this principle into the law and uh, into the practice, um, the questions can be very, 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 very hard. Uh, and the answers are usually not as clear cut as uh, one would hope. Um, so my question would be, yes, that on the philosophical, let's say abstract level, things are quite clear. Problems arise uh, when we need to deal with a concrete question, you know, is this hate speech? And when we need to deal with a concrete um, questions, like I said, you know, what, what, is now, um, what is now a legally protected good uh, when you look at, uh, hate speech, uh, at hate speech? What do we even protect? Um, for example, now is um, is um, are we also protecting like public order, and to which extent do we protect this with uh, with um, these uh, criminal offenses? Uh, so this is where I see um, where I see the most problems, um, and this was maybe this. This was just uh, the start. I, I started answering these questions, but maybe someone else can uh, also add something. Yeah, I would like to add uh, something also um, relating to our project. So I, I always like to talk about sociological and legal view of hate speech or hateful content. And also with those projects, so uh, Frank and Inzip projects were quite similar regarding the annotators. So we had students annotating cases and I always, always emphasized to them that we are annotating cases, uh, uh, but not in a way that don't annotate as hateful, just those who do you want to take off the whatever Twitter or Facebook or whatever we are analyzing. So it's not about that. It, it, it was about analyzing what kind of content is there online. And especially because of the different kind of content, we also use different kinds of categories. So um, as Petra here posted or sent it, um, we had appropriate, inappropriate and offensive. And the last one is violent. So the most problematic one is, of course, violent. Um, this one could be marked as hate speech, even from a legal point of view, but not always. Um, but maybe mostly, because it's actually violent. But offensive part was not meant to be defined by legal practices. So it's from sociological, not even sociological. As Petra said, we were not even including only uh, deprivileged uh, groups. We were including all. So it's not even from sociological point of view. It's just the hateful content in general. So it's not about removing everything we see as offensive or non-appropriate in that manner. So if I can add something... I would say that we are more looking at what the discourse is like. So when you, there's a difference online versus speaking face to face, because when you speak to somebody, look him in the eye. And even when you make a joke, if you went a little bit over, then you would stop on the internet. Usually there is no these boundaries and things kept, keep going and going without any, this kind of, you know, normal kind of uh, drawback. So I, I will share an example of what we have of, as a violent tweet. There's a tweet saying that whenever I see somebody on an electric scooter, I feel like I have to kick him. So this is violent, we would agree. I, but as I read it, I don't really see this big danger of people going around and kicking people as of this. So it is very difficult to annotate these things. And there is a kind of dark humor that is a big part of it. Um, I, I can share another example that I that was very interesting. We went through it uh, with Ida. It was a, a tweet saying like, if you had as many as you, as we do, you would also want to drown them all in salty water. 
it was about snails on the salad. Um, so if you have a garden, you know what. So it is difficult without context. It's definitely violence or, or kind of. So it's like a big, enormous gray area and we will not solve it. Uh, but it is good to have an impression of how this discourse is evolving and uh, that there are no boundaries. And this our results that when people are anonymous, then these things tend to escalate more. And with the, within a certain groups, things escalate more because in some other groups, there is this social norm of where you stop and where things stop being kind of funny and teasing or unacceptable. Yes, thank you all very much for clarifying this. I think I will um, uh, give Alex Zabarshnik uh, the word again so he can uh, pose his questions for Petra Krajnovak. Go ahead, please. Yeah, uh, thank you. Yes. Um, well, I, um, the presentation was excellent. I learned a lot about Krippendorf Alpha. I think it's a very interesting way, you know, looking at how people actually uh, annotate the same tweets differently, right? So I think that's a kind of important measures that you have. My question is related to data acquisition. Did you have any issues with data acquisition? I mean, um, you annotated a lot of a big corpus of tweets, right? So. But in terms of personal data protection, etc., I don't want to be kind of uh, trying to find loopholes here or what did you do, do wrong, but what kind of difficulties did you have? Because, I mean, part of my research interest is, is, is kind of how to find kind of a balance, you know, between kind of data protection that's really tight on, on the one hand, on the other hand, you know, kind of have an access to data and have kind of you and be able to make a great research you know so what are the difficulties that you you're having that you have that you did you have uh in accessing all these data and uh, another question is the data the annotated set already available for other uh, researchers okay so i will start from the backwards the, the annotated data is available and you can find it by googling my name it really helps uh, it's on the clarin repository um, so we are in a kind of gray um, area here. Uh, our data that we collected and annotated is uh, published according to the Twitter terms of service. So it means that only IDs plus the annotations are published. So those who would want to use the data need to download the tweets themselves. Uh, Twitter offer, offers an open API, so we can scroll uh, the data. Um, is a tweet, uh, you know, a public manifestation, as it in, in some definitions of what is a private data and what is not private data? We, we say that it is, and hopefully nobody will sue us. I believe that it's important that we do this kind of research. So no offense to Facebook representatives here, but if they have, if they are the only one who have the data, this is uh, problematic. So now we operate with Twitter and with YouTube, while we are not able to operate with Facebook because of the data restrictions that they impose. Also in accordance to the GDPR and similar data privacy protection laws. So uh, tweet in general in the scientific community, machine learning uh, language, natural language processing and so on, it is a common practice also to use Twitter data the way we use it. So we are not a kind of big exception here. Uh, we would like to have a definite answer from anybody that it's okay, but we don't. <laughs> So we are kind of on our own risk. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I'm really aware of these difficulties. Also in the computer vision community, I think they are they are scraping uh, visual data. I mean uh, faces, right? So it's even maybe more kind of on the in a, in a gray area. <laughs> thank you. Well, well, tweets are still public manifestations, mm -hmm. kind of. But this is yeah, you know better than me. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Not totally clear. <laughs> Okay, thank you both. Um, 
Okay, so far we seem to be done with the questions and also our time is slowly running out. If there is another question, um, either from the audience or from the speakers, Vittoria maybe would like yeah, to- Yeah, I, I just wanted to say one thing in response to, to Jan's question before whether we you know, work with uh, local law enforcement. I, I just want to stress one thing that, that we do respect local content laws, including when it comes to hate speech. So, you know, if governments or non-governmental entities believe that something on the platform violates the local laws, they can contact us to restrict access to that content. And so if after legal review, we determine that the content is in fact illegal under local law, then we do make it unavailable in the relevant country or territory, you know, if it does not violate our hate speech policy already. And, and we also publish a transparency report that details instances where we have limited access to content based on local law. I hope that answers some of your question, Jan. Yes, it does actually. Um, thank you. Thank you. But however, mostly you don't actively seek participation of local authorities. This is what I was aiming at. No, we don't do that actively. But I also want yeah. to stress that when we kind of develop our policies, we do work with local yeah. stakeholders to make sure that we incorporate their, their feedback and recommendations when kind of developing our decision making process around these things. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, thank you both. Um, if there are any other questions or urges to respond, uh, please don't be shy, uh, since otherwise, yeah, it is also seven. So if there are no other questions, I would like to warmly thank all of the guest speakers today. Thank you so much for coming. This was extremely interesting. Uh, I did record it, so uh, hopefully the people who missed out uh, will be able to watch it later. Um, yeah, so this is it from me. Uh, thank you so much for coming also to the audience. I hope you enjoyed the discussion, learned something new and um, have a nice evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Bye, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, bye. Bye, thank you. Mm -hmm.